Hi, this is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church in Pittsburgh. This program will give you a glimpse into the life of an amazing group of people who are seeing God do tremendous things. We trust that you're encouraged by our rich worship service and the ministry of God's Word. We'd love to have you visit with us here some Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to make you welcome, and I know the Holy Spirit would encourage you. We take time in His presence to enjoy Him. Love to have you do that with us here at Zion Christian Church. Good morning. I want to welcome you to Zion Christian Church's Palm Sunday service, live streaming here from our sanctuary in Pittsburgh. We're so excited because God's given us a beautiful day and we have the joy and the privilege of coming to his word, coming to him in worship, sharing this time together, even by live streaming in the presence of God. So I would just like you to pray with me today as we begin our worship service here on Palm Sunday. Dear God, we just want to thank you that you are the risen Lord. We thank you that you are the living God. We thank you that Jesus is real and that your presence is with us. Lord, we ask that you would be honored and glorified. We present ourselves before you, Lord, to give you praise and glory and honor. No rock's going to take our place today, Lord, because we're going to worship you. And we thank you, Lord, that you are the answer, and we praise and bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Come to God's word on Palm Sunday. I want to thank our team and our overall team for leading us in worship here today. And it's good to connect with the Lord. But today, as we come to the Lord's Word. It is Palm Sunday, and we're going to be talking about some things that are seasonal and related to this week, Holy Week, Passion Week, that begins here uh, on Palm Sunday. And so as we think about Palm Sunday, we are going to... um, try to find our slide presentation here. Uh, But one of the scriptures that is often quoted is a prophecy from the book of Zechariah in chapter 9 and verse 9 that says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble, mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And this prophecy from Zechariah was one of many that was fulfilled by the Lord as Passion Week uh, began with his riding into Palm Sunday to the crowd shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, and the fulfillment of this prophecy about Christ entering Jerusalem on a donkey. It's uh, very, in- I think it's very interesting the accounts in the Bible about how this happened. The disciples said to him, Lord, where are we going to prepare the Passover? And he said, well, go into the city and you'll find a guy with a donkey and you say to him, you know, take it and the Lord has need of it. And uh, I'd be like, uh, what time should I go into the city? And (laughs) what road should I take as I go into the city? You know, I'd be, uh, all of it would be on me. How do I know what time? How do I know when this guy's going to be there? How how do I know what road to take? There are many roads into the city. But it just happened. And it's just so uh, wonderful how refreshing it is to live in the spirit. And so that's sort of some of the background to uh, how this came about. But you know, on Palm Sunday, we focus on the crowd shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. And rightly so. This was the sort of the 
crucial time in the three and a half years of the ministry of Jesus where he finally was getting the recognition that he deserved. And as he came into uh, the city of Jerusalem that day, they were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. They were calling him the Messiah. And uh, there's no question about it. So, you know, we focus on the crowd shouting Hosanna to the son of David, but that is not what Jesus was focusing on as he came into the city during that time. Christ himself was centering on his coming, scourging and crucifixion and resurrection and ascension. And it starts in uh, Luke's gospel in chapter 9 with verse 51. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, and verse 51. When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. So Jesus, as he was setting himself to come into Jerusalem to be crucified and scourged and to, uh, to rise again from the dead, to ascend into heaven, these are the things that he was thinking of. We're thinking of the praise that he was given. He was thinking of the, the heart of the reason that he was born was to go to that cross and to die upon the cross and return to his Father in heaven and send the Holy Spirit. So Luke's gospel in chapter 18, verses 31 through 34, tells us this. He took the 12 aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written about the prophets, through the prophets, about the Son of Man, will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day he will rise again. But the disciples understood none of these things, and the meaning of this statement was hidden from them. And they did not comprehend the things that were said. It just seemed completely unfathomable to them that he could be literally saying that these things were going to happen. But yet, of course, he was literally saying that these things would happen. And I just love how the Lord uh, works. Just, you know, uh, no one in the entire history of the human race just calmly announced that they would be brutally murdered, killed, and rise again from the dead. Just calmly announcing the truth to his disciples as to what was going to take place. These are the things that were on the mind of Jesus all the things that were written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. That word accomplished is the word, the same word in the Greek language that Jesus uttered upon the cross when he said, it is finished. It is the same word in the Greek language. It means brought to a, a successful conclusion. It, it, it is complete. And if you look at both these passages together, all things that are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be brought to a successful conclusion. And on the cross, as he bore the wrath of God against our sin and took the penalty that we deserved, he cried out, it is brought to a complete conclusion. The wrath of God is satisfied and the gift of God of eternal life is available freely to one and all because I took their place. Amen. It's beautiful. So he says to them, th these are the things that are on his mind. All things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be brought to a successful conclusion. Upon the cross, when he was ready to leave this earth and, and uh, do what, what came next, he would call out, it has been brought to a successful conclusion. The plan of God from before the foundation of the world has been brought to a successful conclusion. I can start preaching <laughs> about next week, <laughs> but I won't, I won't, I won't. John chapter 19, verse 30. 
When Jesus, therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. It's the same word. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What a beautiful, beautiful thing. The prophecies, the pictures, the promises, the shadows, the types. The sacrificial system would find its fulfillment in the death of Christ upon the cross. The feasts of Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits would find their conclusion in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Abraham's son, in whom all nations would be blessed, it is now brought to a successful conclusion. The gospel can go to the ends of the earth. The tree that was thrown into the poisonous waters and made it sweet had been brought to a successful conclusion. Look and live at the serpent upon the pole and be healed from the plague has been brought to a successful conclusion. The cleansing of the leper has been brought to a successful conclusion. Do you know how a leper was cleansed in the, book of, in, the, in the Bible, in the book of Leviticus? They had to take a live bird, and two live birds, and they would tie one of them to two sticks of wood. And they would wring its neck and kill it, and the blood would fall into a bowl of water. Then that bird, obviously, was finished. So he would be taken off the two sticks of wood. And they would take the second bird, which took now carried on. They would dip him in the blood and the water and let him fly into heaven. Leprosy is a picture of sin. And this is a, a promise. It was a provision for their day, certainly. But it was equally a promise of the one who would come who would hang upon two sticks, a cross, on our place and die to forgive and cleanse us of our leprosy, our sin. And when it was all finished, the soldier would ram a spear into his side and blood and water would come out exactly as the type had pictured. Well, not exactly, but as the type had pictured. And then Jesus would ascend back to his father beautiful picture. All these have been brought to a successful conclusion. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. God, after he had spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. You worried about your life and your future during this time? Do you know you are connected to the one who upholds all things by the word of his power? He is the radiance of the Father's glory. He is the light that shines from the light bulb. You know, you can't really separate the light that shines from the light bulb from the bulb. He is the radiance of the Father's glory. He upholds all things by the word of his power. And as Jesus entered into Jerusalem and went through Palm Sunday, through his crucifixion and resurrection, do you know there were 13 times that I can find that he referenced, it is written. He knew exactly what was going to take place. It had all been foretold. And that is one of the great proofs that the Bible is the inspired word of God because it is not even remotely possible for people to put together a book with multiple offers over a period of thousands of years unless it was ex ex uniquely, I don't even have words, uniquely, <laughs> uniquely inspired by God. And that all came to pass, and it all centered on this week. Not all, but the majority of it centered on this week. And he kept saying, it is written. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. 
Matthew 26, 31, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Luke 20, 17, he looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, thus has become the cornerstone. Luke 24, 44, he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which were written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. John 12, 14 to 16, Jesus finding a donkey sat on it. As it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And there are more. John 15, 25, they have done this to fulfill the word that was written in their law. They have hated me without a cause. He said to them, do you not hear, Matthew 21, 16, what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Hess, have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise for yourselves? Matthew 21, 42, Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scripture the stone which the builders rejected? This has become the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord and it is marvelous in our lives. Do you know that quotation from that psalm is, is a well-known scripture from a, many decades ago. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. It comes right from there. What is the day that the Lord has made? Well, in a general sense, the Lord makes every day and we will rejoice and be glad in it. But this was talking about one specific day when the stone that uh, would be rejected and the stone which the builders would, would reject became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord. This is the day that this is really referring to. And it goes on in the next verse and it says, bind the sacrifice to the altar the day of Christ's crucifixion. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Of course, every day he's made, but this is a very special and unique way. John 20, John 19, 24, they said to one another, let us not tear it, but let us cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And do you know that as Jesus came into Jerusalem through the eastern gate, sometimes called the gate of mercy, coming into Jerusalem through the sheep gate were the Passover lambs that were coming into the city to be slain, to fulfill the feast of Passover. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Exodus chapter 12. I hope that you will write that down, and I hope that you will go back and read it. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about what was happening. There were a series of plagues that had been released upon Egypt. And during this series of plagues, God was dealing with the Pharaoh to let his people go. He kept refusing. And finally, after many plagues, God said there would be one plague that would force Pharaoh to let his people go. He would send a death angel upon the land. And Israel could be redeemed from the effects of this plague if they would choose a lamb a spotless lamb. They would examine the lamb for three days. In the writings of the rabbis, they would even look at the eyelids of the lamb to make sure that it was perfect. And at the right time, this lamb would be slain. The lamb would be roasted. They would eat this lamb with their loins girded, meaning they were ready to leave the slavery that they had been in in over 400 years. In the natural, they had no hope of going anywhere. But aren't you glad God is not limited to the natural? And that's true in this crisis as well that we are in. And God said, if you 
take the blood of that lamb and you apply it to your homes with hyssop, which is a weed that could be used sort of like a paintbrush. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that's what happened in Israel that time. The blood delivered the people. And God said to them, year in, year out, you're to have a special meal where you teach your children what happened in Egypt, how the lamb was chosen, how the lamb was examined, how the lamb was slain, how the lamb was roasted, how we ate with our loins girded, how when God saw the blood, he passed over us year in, year out, year in, year out, generation after generation after generation, eating the Passover lamb. Luke's gospel, they're eating their Passover. Looks like it was a night early this time. Luke chapter 22, verses 19 through 20. Jesus, in this memorial meal, when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, no one had ever heard this before in this Passover meal. No one had ever heard this before. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The Jews had developed a pouch in which there were three pieces of matzah. And the host of the meal would take the middle piece and break it and distribute it to the people. They had developed a series of four cups of wine that were present during the course of the meal. This is the meal that we call the Last Supper. And Jesus took, as every host had from the time they had that pouch with the three pieces, he took the middle piece and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And why three? Without realizing it, they were celebrating the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The Son was the one who was broken. That the blood would be our protection that when God sees the blood, he will pass over us. A beautiful picture of salvation. No one had ever heard this before, that this, this bread is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, and this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. No one had ever heard that before either. But you know, Jesus came in to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He came in one way, the Passover lambs that were going to be slaughtered were coming in another way. And he was examined just like the Passover lamb. Judas, Matthew 27, verses 3 through 5, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Pilate said to them, I find no guilt in him. John 19, 5 and 6. Herod found nothing in Jesus deserving of death. Luke 23, 14 and 15. He's being examined. False witnesses couldn't even agree on fake charges to bring against him. Matthew 26, 59 through 61. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. They did not find any, even though false witnesses came forward. Centurion, Luke 23, 47. When the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, surely this man was innocent. 
Jesus was the Passover lamb. He was what it had represented all along. He came into Jerusalem as they were coming in another way. He took that bread that had been reenacted generation after generation, year after year after year, and he said, this bread, this is my body which is broken for you. And the lamb was slain. It is finished. It has been brought to a successful conclusion. All that the prophets had said would be brought to a successful conclusion. It is finished. And the blood of Christ is available to us to trust in, to believe his crucifixion, his death on our behalf, It's for us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 20 says this, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. Foreknown before the foundation of the world. He's appeared in these last times for our sake. That when God sees the blood, he will pass over us. Forgiveness is an amazing gift that Christ accomplished upon that cross. Every one of us stands guilty before God. There is no one except Jesus who has lived a sinless life. We have all sinned, the Bible says, and fallen short of the glory of God. And we will all give an account to him at the end of our lives for, for what we have done with our lives and the way that we have lived. Well, how does the blood of Christ protect us from the wrath and the plague? Well, you have to apply it. If they had just left the blood in the basin, it wouldn't have done anything. They had to take it with hyssop and mark their homes and mark their lives that, yes, we are trusting in the blood of the Lamb to be the protection from wrath. And when God saw the blood, how do we apply it? What is hyssop in our lives? Hyssop is faith. Where we accept what he did on our behalf as the finished work of Christ. And we apply in our own lives through faith what Christ accomplished for us. We surrender our lives to him. We receive the gift that he has given to us. I went to church my entire life until I was a teenager without being a Christian. I knew something about the blood of Christ, but it wasn't real to me. But when I gave my life to Christ, it's like I picked up the hyssop stick and acknowledge before God, God, I am a sinner. And I need your forgiveness. And I thank you that you accomplished this for me. And I took that hyssop of faith and I marked my life. I said, Jesus, your blood has cleansed me. Jesus, I'm relying on your finished work on my behalf. And do you know something radical happened in my life when I did that? I mean radical. I went from attending church every week just because it was a tradition in our home to having a dynamic relationship with the God of the universe who had taken away my sin. He had taken away the barrier that stood between me and him. And there was communion and there was fellowship and I knew that he was real. That was a radical transformation. And that radical transformation has marked my life 
from that teenage time on. I remember my first uh, Easter season as a new believer, as a teenager. Last night, I watched the Ten Commandments on television, or at least part of it. My first Easter, my parents didn't have a TV. It had broken and was sitting there, and they did not get it repaired. They were at church. It must have been Palm, uh, Good Friday or something. We had 3 o'clock service, I think, 1 to 3 or something, 3 to 6. I can't remember exactly, but I remember 3 o'clock being in that equation somewhere. So they were at church, and I was home, and I remember walking up to that TV, enjoying the Lord's presence, and I said, Lord, I'm going to turn on this TV, because I knew the Ten Commandments movie was on. And I promise you that if you let this thing work, I would turn it off when I'm finished. I turned on the TV. It was one of those that had a little knob, you know, real old thing. And it came on. And I watched the Ten Commandments. And then I was really tempted to leave it on. (laughs) But I rose to the challenge and turned it off. About an hour later, I came back. I I had to see, you know, was it going to work? I turned it on again, and it didn't come on. (laughs) But I went from knowing some things intellectually about this crucifixion of Jesus to having the barrier between God and me removed my sin and enjoying a relationship with him. And that relationship with him is the most defining thing in my life. It's what holds me in the hard times and it's it's what gives me joy in the good times, and it gives me joy in the bad times. uh, He has removed the veil. The the judgment that I deserve for my sin fell upon Christ. I put my trust in the blood that he shed. And he's my father. This is what Jesus came to accomplish. And if you... Stir yourself up to trust in God. If you stir yourself up to believe the Lord, to exercise faith in his word, things that are happening like what are happening in our world, in our country right now with this virus, they're not going to keep you down for long because your relationship with God It's going to cause the joy to come back in your life again. It's going to cause the confidence to come back in your life again. Uh, We don't need to know everything. People people get all excited. Well, I don't know what's going to happen, and this may happen, and that may happen. Here's what you need to know. God is faithful, and his hand is upon you. That's what you need to know. And rejoice in the Lord when the news is good. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, in case you missed it the first time, stir up the joy. Don't stir up the dread. God has got you. And Jesus, you know, God went to a whole lot of effort to get you. There was a plan that had unfolded over thousands of years, multiple authors who wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit in the pages of Scripture, to bring this to pass for you, for me, the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth, the precious blood of a spotless lamb, accepted by God, These are the things that were on the mind of Jesus when he entered into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. I'm just going to give you a 
a, li- a partial list of the prophecies that were fulfilled. A partial lift, list. And if you want a copy of it, you can find our church email address on our website. Send me a request. I'll be happy to send you a copy or call us or something. But he was the seed of the woman who would bruise the serpent's head. The descendant of Abraham, descendant of Isaac, descendant of Jacob, of the tribe of Judah, heir to David's throne, Emmanuel, God with us, born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, the time of his birth foretold by Daniel, the slaughter of the innocents uh, surrounding his birth foretold by Jeremiah, his flight to Egypt, his messenger that would prepare the way, his ministry in Galilee, that he would be the promised prophet, that he would teach in parables, he would be rejected by the Jews, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, betrayed by a friend, sold for 30 pieces of silver, the money for that used to buy the potter's field. False witnesses would speak at his trial. He would be silent before his accusers. He would be beaten and spat on. He would be mocked, scourged, his beard plucked from his face. He would be crucified. He would suffer thirst upon the cross. He would face death in life's prime. His death would be with criminals. He would be buried with the rich. He would uh, rise again from the dead in his resurrection. He would ascend back to the Father and have eternal dominion, everlasting dominion. All things written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be completed, brought to a successful conclusion, fulfilled, accomplished. He did that for you. And you may be like me. Maybe you know something about him, you know, but, but you don't really know him. When we were in Scotland, there was a, we had this old car. It was a British Ford. It was called a Zephyr. I don't know if any of you ever heard of a Ford Zephyr. Youth without youth with the mission, YWAM, youth without any money. You know, you had to kind of make do with what you had. So this car had big engine problems, and this guy, who came to our base sometimes, offered to help me. Actually, uh, he offered for me to help him, really, to replace the pistons in this engine with oversized piston rings. So as we're working on this car, he's, he's asking like all kinds of questions. And he says, you know, what is it about you, you guys? You here at this Youth with a Mission base, you, you have something different than what I have. What is it? So I said to him, you know, in this country, speaking of Britain, everybody knows the Queen's voice on the radio. You know when she gets on the radio, you hear her voice. Everyone knows it's the queen, and everyone knows a little bit about what she likes and doesn't like. At the time, she didn't like Prince Charles' antics. Everybody knew that. Now there's someone else's antics she doesn't like. (laughs) I said, everyone knows a few things about the queen, what she likes and what she doesn't like, but very few people have a personal relationship with the queen. I said, you're like the first group. You know a few things about God. You know a few things he likes, and you know a few things he doesn't like. But Jesus came to give you a relationship with him by forgiving your sins, by wiping them away. That's why he went to the cross. And you can experience that. And this young man did experience that. He gave his life to Christ. He was a different person when he would come back. One of the great evangelistic tools in Youth with the Mission was the local mechanic, but there was a mechanic for a time on the base. It wasn't when I had this car. But they would say that more people got saved in his car than anywhere else in all of Scotland because he drove so recklessly. (laughs) Not the best way to get saved, I guess. But you know, if you're watching this, You need to make sure that you've taken the hyssop and marked your life with it. 
Because if you know about it and you leave it in the bucket, it's just not going to do you any good. You have to apply it to your life. You have to give your life to Jesus. And it begins by acknowledging that you are a sinner. That's where it all begins. And it's just simply the truth. It's not an insult. It's just simply the truth. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we have to begin by acknowledging that. We are sinful people, and we can't blame other people for our sinfulness. There are some people I've met who have have made a science of blaming other people for the mistakes that they have chosen to make in their life. Now, sometimes other people's influence is real and genuine, but you still make your own decisions, and you can't blame it on other people. You can't blame it on anything other than you have made sinful mistakes in your life, and you stand guilty before God. And there's a plague that will come in judgment day upon all who haven't marked their homes, marked their lives with the blood of the Lamb. Christ came and entered into Jerusalem. We think about how great it was that he was acknowledged for that little bit of time, but he wasn't thinking about that. He was thinking about everything is going to have a successful conclusion that had been written by the prophets over thousands of years about this amazing gift of salvation that he freely gives to us. And his role in it is what he was thinking about. Jesus came to die in our place to satisfy the Father's wrath against sin that we could be forgiven and live life as his children. So if you're ready to acknowledge that you're a sinful person and you need the salvation that God has provided in Christ, I want you to pray with me. Dear Lord God, we come before you now and we acknowledge, Lord, we are lost without you even if we know some things about you and don't have a relationship with you, we desperately need you in our lives, Lord. We need your forgiveness. We will give account one day. And we thank you that you made it possible for us to give an account as those who have been forgiven by acknowledging the wonderful gift of salvation and eternal life that Jesus died to make real to us. Father, in your name, I receive forgiveness of my sins and I give my life to you. I give myself completely to you, Lord. Take my life, Lord. I choose to follow you. I put my trust in the blood of Christ and I receive the gift of salvation. Thank you that I've become your child. Teach me to live for you. Teach me to live in you. And teach me to live connected to the children of God who love and follow you. In Jesus' name. This is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church. I want to thank you for watching this video of our worship service. God is on the move, and we are so thankful. I'd love to invite you to join us Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock here at Zion Christian Church. I know that you would be encouraged by our worship and the ministry of God's Word. It's a wonderful group of people to be connected to. Why not join us this Sunday at Zion Christian Church? God bless you. Oh,